So yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, first uh, let me first introduce myself. Um, actually, it was a short no notice, so I hadn't the time to prepare well, you know. <laughs> so yeah. Um, good good afternoon to all of you. And uh, my name is Kushbu, and I have just completed my masters from Berkeley itself from International Business Economics and Finance, uh, with one of the subjects as Behavioral Finance, and I have been always interested in behavioral economics and you know these subjects which can be you know realistic and applied uh, with sub, uh, with you know the major set of economics so yeah so at the outset i want to express my heartfelt gratitude to uh, the uh, webinar organizers nivida and uh, all of you bs events and sorry i don't know you all but yeah all of you um, and uh, one of my reasons to uh, you know conduct this webinar was um, uh, when I started my behavioral journey, uh, I wasn't able to get, you know, a lot of resources and things and I didn't, I wasn't able to find a lot of people. So my reason was, my reason to do this webinar was if I'm able to help any one of you, at least a single guy who can, you know, just, even if they are just in their uh, budding, uh, you know, stage of behavioral economics, curiosity, or maybe just they are starting or maybe they, they don't know about it. So if I'm able to help, that would be really good because I want to pass my knowledge and the things I have learned, the resources I have, you know, gotten from the seniors and my professors. So yeah, it's all about, you know, sharing. So, okay. Um, let's start. Um, I'm going to present my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, um, while the presentation is going on, if anyone you have any question, you can just, you know, tell me. Okay. So, um, uh, most of you guys would be knowing about behavioral economics uh, from the time uh, when the Richard Thaler uh, won the Nobel Prize and, you know, when Dan Daniel Kahneman uh, published his books and things like that started happening or maybe you were just interested. So, what behavioral economics is, is that uh, I would like to tell you it's a branch of economics. Many of the, uh, you know, many of the uh, economists does not agree with this, that it should be a separate branch. But I think as economic student, you must agree with me that there is a, you know, missing quantity, uh, missing, uh, I mean, uh, you know, um, substance in economics. That is, we do not uh, include the uh, behavior of people and the psychology of it they are mere rationals and mere e agents right so so that is what is be uh, behavioral economics you know compensating everything and of course um, so behavioral economics studies the effects of psychological cognitive emotional cultural and social factors on the decisions of individuals and institutions and how those decisions vary from those applied by classical economic theory Right. Like uh, you guys have uh, studied about utility, utility theory, expected utility theory and how it deviates from that and bounded rationality and things like that. So I'm not going to go that deeper, but I'm going to just introduce with the you know basic concepts of it um, so that you can all be familiar. And of course, I'm going to share my experience of my project and um, if any question you want to ask about my you know, career or things like that. So uh, first of all, uh, I would like to deal with loss aversion. So uh, did you guys uh, feel that uh, sometimes uh, uh, you don't want to, you know, lose something, but you would like to gain that? I mean, the loss hurts more than, you know, the gain. Have you guys felt that? Like if I'm giving you a uh, thousand bucks and uh, I'm asking you uh, that uh, if I take that away from you, that would be hurtful. Or if I give that away, if, if I give you that, that will be more, you know, beneficial you, or you would be more happy. What do you guys think? Do you have any such kind of experiences that you don't want to lose or 
losing is hard. Yeah, losing hurts yeah. almost twice as much. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, loss aversion, uh, it was given by Daniel Kahneman. This is the history uh, with his associate Amos Tversky. And um, uh, they were researching on you know, subjective probability. And that paper on subjective probabili probability contains a lot of things, uh, not from loss aversion, but the you know subparts of loss aversion like uh, reflection effect and isolation effect and the other things. So uh, what he told that uh, loss aversion, you know, um, it's like when, when you are uh, seeing this graph. So uh, please uh, uh, see this graph. So if you can see that, you know, on that point on your uh, first quadrant, you can see that the gain of um, a point is like a 0 0.5, okay, 0 0.05, 0 0.05 dollars. Uh, uh, and its value is something between 10 and 20, like uh, 17 points. But if I tell you that the same utility or maybe the disutility, uh, to be fair, uh, to be speaking, uh, is more for the sim similar point of loss is more like, see, uh, the gain of 0 0.05 brings you the value, uh, brings you to the value of 17, but the loss of minus 0 0.05 brings you to the value of 40. So it is kind of like, it just doubles. This is what prospect theory tells us. So while loss aversion uh, is the, you know, initial part of my PPT is because this is the most common, you know, psychological um, behavior that we all share. Apart from, you know, uh, being students of economics, we, we all know that, yeah, we don't want to lose or, and, you know, loss is painful. So, yeah. Um, so, examples of loss aversion. Um, so, uh, uh, on the right hand side, uh, yeah, let's deal first with the right hand side. So, as I told you that winning the amount of 0 0.05, take it, you know, $10 is similar to 0 0.05 in this example. So, the person is like, he cool, yeah, he's fine with it. But losing that is really making him sad. It's, it's really painful. Nobody wants to lose. This is what economics doesn't, you know, account it says uh, uh, economics simply says that uh, if you are losing that simple amount and at the and the same amount if you are gaining you won't be that sad or you know it would it wouldn't make uh, so much of you know uh, dis uh, difference in your utility and disutility but behavioral economics accounts this um, so on and on the left hand side we have loss aversion and you can see that there is a thing called gain frame and loss frame so what happens is ki, uh, if you are if you if you're gonna read Daniel Kahneman's paper, you're gonna find out that when he designed experiments in a frame which the options were given in the gain form. Like uh, you know, if you if uh, if you take this chance, you're gonna win this much. It it is not focusing on what you are gonna lose. It's focusing more on what you're gonna gain. And in another and in another set, he explained about loss frame. So loss frame, it's like uh, you're gonna lose this much, you know, focusing on the loss, but not on the gain that these things we can see in the marketing, you know, marketing uh, uh, sales and advertisements and stuff like that. So uh, what is the difference between, uh, you know, why mentioning gain frame and loss frame? If, if it is there, so why would we mention that? Yeah, it is a thing. But what it tells us that, you know, the uh, the behavior of people changes. Like in game frame, you would be like, yeah, I'm ready to take the bet. If the bet, you know, has a higher quantity and losing and, uh, you know, the framing is not in the way like you're going to lose this much. So you would be ready to take the bet. But in scenarios where the losses are projected you know, higher, you won't, uh, you wouldn't want to take the game. Okay. Uh, this is, you know, the typical example, like, uh, you know, yeah, loss aversion. So it is the application of loss aversion. So what is happening is, uh, 
what it is you know actual price we don't know about that but the company whatever the product is it it's saying that it's on this point and uh, if you can read you know the arrow here that uh, no thanks i'm not interested in quickly obtaining my dream body i understand this is my only opportunity to get access to this information and i'm okay with missing out i understand that after declining this offer it may never be available again at any price even if i wish to pay more i will pass this on this forever so can you see that this website or this company is focusing so much on loss that if you're going if you if you if you're not going to buy this then you're going to lose this much and uh, you are accepting that yes yes i'm going to be like this and i'm okay with that so it is hurtful yeah don't you agree that it is hurtful so this is the typical example of loss frame that marketers you know like on amazon we see that yeah this is half the price and if you don't get it you know it will never be on that price so it actually there are a lo lot of you know real life examples on this to make people buy things and and you, you know just to make them do uh, cert certain actions that if you're not going to do this you're going to lose like uh, uh, i don't know about your household but Uh, since my childhood i have been told that yeah if you're not going to study or if you're not going to do this you're going to lose this and you won't be you know getting that i don't you agree that it it is kind of you know that it it triggers that part of our brain that uh, something if it is prevented from you know acquiring that you can't get it or you won't be able to get it then we are like you know yes we want to get that you know that example of elephant in the room Uh, do you guys know that that if i tell you that not think about the elephant but you will actually be thinking about the elephant okay so um so uh, uh, now loss aversion in terms of behavioral finance um as you guys said that uh, you were focusing your last uh, webinar yesterday on you know personal finance so it would be you know addition to that for behavioral finance so first of all i would like to tell you uh, that behavioral finance is a branch of behavioral economics and it is the amalgamation of behavioral economics and behavioral finance as you can perceive it and uh, it it deals with you know market sentiments and market um, you know uh, the what is prevailing in the market and what the um, investors are thinking and what the you know uh, uh, everybody is like behaving in the market so fine uh, what behavioral finance adds to finance is like it uh, it you know explains the aspect of people that why they are behaving in this way so this is kind of you know um, making the uh point stronger that concept stronger that reason stronger that why someone is behaving this way why investors are not following the you know uh, prevailing views prevailing trend so yeah um and loss aversion in terms of behavioral finance is uh, loss aversion is a tendency in behavioral finance where investors are so fearful of losses that they focus on trying to avoid a loss more so uh, so than on making gains so it's like uh, you have seen that if you guys invest or if you have heard anyone investing you guys know that if they uh, they are incurring any losses uh, they won't be you no know, comfortable or they won't be willing to with withdraw from those stocks or um, they they won't be uh, they they aren't going to stop on that they would be like uh, let the market uh, you know shift some uh, sh shift to some level and uh, what if i am able to make some gains so this is a application this is a typ typical application of loss aversion that we do not want to realize that we have lost that sometimes it's better in in certain market scenarios that sometimes it's better to you know uh, just uh, stop loss and uh, you know take that stop loss for uh, for a, any typical form or maybe you know uh, that withdraw from that stock but people don't want to lose so loss aversion comes here into play and uh, uh, examples of loss aversion in behavioral finance is you know investing in low return guaranteed investments over more promising investments like you know uh, you have seen that earlier people earlier or uh, these days also people try to invest in sips even i know that sips you know give you 
a lot of return in the long run but in the short run they're not giving you any such you know such drastic ret- returns but still people do that because uh, first if they want you know uh, long run returns then yeah that is okay but even if they need money right now and they want it and they're not investing this is because loss aversion they don't want to lose the losing factor the losing you know psychology is so strong that they are like okay let's stick to the you know uh, lower risk return uh, portfolios or maybe you know stocks okay it's not giving us a lot of promises but okay let's stick to it uh, like uh, um yeah. okay um, Uh, so not selling a stock that you hold uh, when your current rational analysis of the stock clearly indicates that it should be abandoned as an investment this is you know just i explained a uh, few minutes ago that people do not you know sell the stock and do, they do not get uh, get the lose of it that yeah i should stop it because it's not making any gain so um um but these are these were the problems uh, where we behavioral economists or you know economists come that how to avoid these negative effects of loss aversion so first is like you know the basic economics thing think like an agent think and rationalize uh, that uh, is it is it is it you know the place where i should stop investing or you know just uh, pull out from this stock or uh, limit my stock or what should i do so think like think like that not in a way that yeah i have made that, i have made this much of losses uh, i have made this much of losses and i'm going to keep on you know holding it because eventually maybe i would get some gain uh, you guys be, you guys would be knowing about sung fallacy right um yes 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 we do yeah so that is uh, one of the factors that you know uh, uh, that strengthens this loss aversion that we we are we fall prey to uh, sunk cost fallacy so another uh, another thing uh, another step or maybe you know uh, thing to avoid loss aversion is framing try framing okay uh, so uh r- while rationalizing what you can do is uh, you can think that okay i have lost this much but let's move from the thought of losing let's taking it from uh, taking in, in a way that okay um i have gotten this amount i and have gotten this amount you know that the words the words have a really uh, huge effect on ourselves that if we say you know um loss and you uh, lost you have lost or you know stuff like that so you can change the frame you can you know alter it effects like you can do one thing also that it's famous in psychology giving a third person example to yourself um, makes situations better for the people to handle like uh, if you have experienced any loss in a um, in a certain stock so take uh, so uh, think about this like uh, there is a person um, maybe george george has uh, lost this much of amount in this stock and uh, should he continue or should he just withdraw from that so these you know separate your emotions and your rational thinking that agent perspective so it helps that third person framing or you know just framing okay so um, and another thing is to you know um apply stop losses uh, anyone you anyone of you who has started investing or uh, know about this must be knowing about stop losses that it is an option it is an option that you can you know apply to that after this amount i'm going to uh, withdraw that i'm not going to invest any further or maybe i'm just going to stop okay and invest in balanced portfolios like availability like uh, you you guys have studied statistics so you guys know that um about variance if if i tell you that uh, okay let's imagine a normal curve okay in normal distribution curve what we have is from the mean we have equal amounts of uh, you know data points data points or maybe you know let's take it as data points uh, points maybe uh, on the both of the sides of the mean so if a portfolio is is witnessing gains um, maybe probably more than you know uh more than uh, what you have expected or um more than you uh, you were like you you uh, from the point that where you were um, uh, doing your loss aversion thing that because of loss aversion i cannot invest in this 
uh, firm or invest in this stock so if you are uh, investing in a risky return okay ris risky return or risky stock so if it's on the uh, left hand side and on the right hand side you have a stock which gains you uh, which lets you gain a lot of uh, you know returns so it will balance out your portfolio okay and your gain and your gains and losses will balance out you won't be losing a lot of your money or you know a lot of your investments so yeah these were the things to avoid loss aversion um uh, we um uh, so after this uh there are several effects and biases in behavioral economics um but uh so i would like to you know um share some of those like endowment effect um do you guys know about endowment effect some of us might okay okay so um, have you uh, acha uh, let me tell you one scenario so um uh, one, every one of us okay uh, bought a house okay we bought a house we started living in it um not not living in it but we just bought a house and apart from the profit and loss perspective you know uh, uh, setting the price uh, 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 that much uh, uh, that would be you know uh, bringing us a lot of margin except that if if i ask you to sell your house um what what would uh, you would you would name a price okay you you're going to name a price that yeah i want to sell my house for um maybe 1 crore or maybe um One lakh fifty thousand, or I don't know anything, any anything, any amount. If you have started living in that house, but if you're not living in that house, um, okay. Uh, one more thing. If you are living in that house, uh, there would be you, you. You guys agree that yeah, there would be a possibility that you would be emotionally attached to it. That yeah, I want this house is so precious. Okay. and the other scenario is that you haven't bought the house it's just someone has asked you to price this house what would you do you would just check the market sentiments and you know prices and you would just name the price right but in the previous case where you where you have you know have some attachment to the house you have been um, emotionally attached or maybe it's just thing that you own then you would obviously you would obviously price that house higher than the other price which included only the market sentiments okay this is called endowment effect uh, as you can see in this uh, figure that uh, this guy is telling that okay there is a product uh, and this uh, this product name is let's take it as a blob so orange blob so orange blob um, is not his so it's like he he has been asked to you know name the price he said okay 2 dollars uh, and if he if he is given to uh, if he is given to him and asked so he he is going to tell that yeah it's it's 6 dollars when he's his uh, it's his okay so this is called endowment effect we start owning things and we start value those things higher than the things we have like uh, there is a famous experiment that you know every behavioral economist or uh, behavioral scientist has conducted in their classrooms that they have uh, given a mug to their students or uh, to two set of students uh, not given a uh, first set of students they have given the mug and they ask them to name the price and the other set of students they ask you know just tell the price of the mug and everywhere it has been you know recorded that uh, the first set of students who had the mug and they uh, they kind of owned it in the first place they prized it higher than the other set of students and it, and it was it is really you know um, different from what we uh, what economics says right so this is endowment effect and this happens to all of us in our life that uh, if we want to buy some things we are like okay yeah this is costly and uh, oh yeah or this is cheap uh, i don't want to buy it but if we start owning those things and we explain our friend that oh no it's really good it's cheap but you know it's not that uh, kind of value uh, attains in that kind of value it is more valuable we we do that right so yeah this is endowment effect um so uh, coming to behavioral tools um after the publishing uh, after the publishing of nudge uh, every you know um kid or maybe every 
every person started to take behavioral economics tools as nudge okay so um uh, just a sec uh, do you guys have have any question or should i proceed um, you all can type the questions in the chat or you know you can even unmute yourselves if you have any questions guys yeah exactly you can do that Okay, are there any questions? Okay. okay, if you guys have any question, just type it in the chat box or maybe speak up. It would be, you know, like ice breaking. So, so yeah, behavioral tools, uh, nudging. So after that book, uh, nudge came. Uh, it's like uh, we 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 think that nudge is a behavioral economics tool. If we are using behavioral economics, then we are nudging things. No, it's not like that. Behavioral economics. uses a lot of insights a lot of tools one of them is a nudge and nudge is really powerful because nudge nudge does not involve any you know um forcing other people it does it is cost effective you know the the things uh, which which makes nudge to use in policies or in you know real life applications or maybe um, you know in government schemes or any other things is that that it is really cost effective and you do not have to you know um, design a lot of things you just have to be rational and you know not exactly rational rational and you know understanding the psychology behind the people why you are going to nudge okay so you guys can read the definition um or you can search about it but uh, okay so yeah it's written that it was um, popularized by um, in the book nudge and 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 yeah uh, one more insight i want to share from my end that i attended uh, richard thaler's uh, webinar so what he was saying he was he was a uh, i mean uh, it was a q and a session so he was asked that uh, did you expect nudge to be this famous and uh, you know what was the plausible title that you wanted to keep uh, for the book so he and uh, the other writer kasastin uh, they they agreed on other titles but they were like no the producers were uh, uh, the you know the publishers were like no it's just keep it simple and you know catchy that people can catch stuff like that and for the you know uh, for, uh, for the i mean um, the book has had been the book had gained so much of you know attention and they did not expect it literally they did not expect it because nudge was not a new concept at that time it was already been there people were using it and it was in research papers and everywhere but they introduced it by their book it reached to a lot of people the masses you know that we can buy but we, uh, we can buy from amazon we can just look at it but we we are, we are not going to you know just uh, you know re, uh, google scholar the papers that yeah is that any paper on nudge so this is also a kind of nudge on me uh, make uh, letting people know about nudge that i just published a book he didn't say this but i personally feel this that yeah it can be a nudge uh, he didn't i don't know he did it that or not but it can be a nudge that yeah i just published in the market people can buy it you know it's just you know just giving a little push so nudge um and yeah the other thing uh, the other tool is choice architecture then framing and then intervention or mandation what what choice architecture is um, you guys can um, relate uh, i guess defaults so uh, you guys must have you know ordered food from um, zomato and you guys have seen that uh, there uh, there was uh, there is a little change right now but earlier what did you used to say that um, if you don't want cutlery then tick on the icon right but uh, so that was there uh, so the default option there was that they will send you the cutlery even uh, you are opting uh, you if you are not doing anything but right now if you can see that they have opted the default as no uh, send me the cutlery then tick for it okay so this is one of the examples for choice architecture that setting defaults that how you set defaults and you know guys uh, defaults has so much of application for organ donations i mean 
be uh, uh, um, actually um, I I cannot tell you exactly, but what happened is in a country that um, organ donation rate was comparison to uh, other country was not that high. Okay, but other countries had high organ donation rates. So we, uh, can we say that that yeah uh, in in the first country people do not care about other people's lives. That is why they are not you know um, opting for organ donations. And the in the another country they they care about this. No. It cannot happen because, of course, there is that loss aversion factor. We do not want to lose lives. And there is an altruistic factor, you know, that, yes, we want to do something and it makes us, our life more satisfying. So, so what, uh, so the, uh, the people, so the policymakers of the first country where the organ donation rate was low, what they did is, I guess this was in UK or USA, okay. So what they did is that they, uh, in, you know, may, probably that in driving license form, they set the default option to donate your organ. Okay. They did not say this, that donate your organ. They said, they say that, uh, they said that, if you want to, if you do not want to donate your organ, just stick, just stick on it. Okay. If you do not want, but if you want to donate your organ, you just, you don't have to do anything. So did, they did not force anyone to donate their organs and they did not, you know, uh, uh, started any campaign, which was effective, uh, which was uh, very, you know, costly and things like that. They just simply put one statement, one or two statements in the form. And this was all about it. And this is where choice architecture comes that you just made the choice. Uh, you just altered the choice. You did not force anyone. You did not ask a lot of money. You just made, you just, you know, altered the choice. So, and after that, the organ donations really increased. Um, there is, uh, you know, uh, there are things in behavioral economics that says that, you know, defaults, um, are kind of um, may can be used um, in a you know can be can be misused. Okay, this can also happen because we uh, we we humans are lazy. We do not uh, we are that much of lazy that we do not want to check one option box. Also, we are really lazy. We 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 want to use our cognitive ab abilities as much as possible. This is where heuristics come. Heuristics is another, you know, concept in behavioral economics that tells you um, uh, about how you do things uh, which you were uh, doing, you know, from a lot of time. I'm going to deal that later. So this was choice architecture and then framing. So framing you guys have seen here um, in loss aversion. See, so if one, um, if I want to use one, um, you know, behavioral insights in making my company, uh, in making my company gain more profits, then I'm going to choose the loss frame. Okay. If I'm selling those things, or if I'm going to make people bet on things uh, or maybe lotteries, then I'm going to use the gain frame. So this is one of those gain frame. Okay. Um, okay, then intervention and mandation. This is like, you know, the government says that, yes, this has to be done and this has to be done. So these are kind of um, behavioral tools which can, you know, be used. Um, there is, um, okay, okay, let's talk about heuristics. So heuristics, um, do you guys have any rules of thumb for yourself? Uh, like, um, if you, if I, if I ask you bread, you're going to say butter. Yeah. Instantly. Like if I'm going to ask you that, um, if you see, if you see certain things, I mean, your rules of thumb, like everybody has that thing. Like, um, I have like for my personal experience that, um, um, if, if I'm experiencing anxiety, then of course I'm going to do good in my exams <laughs> because that makes me, that makes me perform better. So that is my kind of heuristics that, yeah, if I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to worry about my exam scores. If I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to get anxiety and stuff like that. So it is kind of heuristics that, um, uh, another example that, um, you know, that uh, in America, this is this is you know an extreme example that in in America um, there was a research that um, research or maybe you know that just finding survey that white people were sc scared of trusting black people 
if they see a black people they were like uh, probably they're going to harm us if they are you know if if a white guy is walking in night alone and if a, he, if he sees a black guy and uh, you know his personality is like of you know that that you cannot differentiate uh, he's you know wealthy or maybe he's a poor it's just simple then that guy that white guy is going to you know get scared that maybe he's going to rob so this is their heuristics in play okay so uh, do you guys hate uh, do you guys have any heuristics uh, do you want to share if you have any in life that um, i'm going to do this if this happens everybody has that in savita ma'am's class we used to discuss about our heuristics that yeah, yeah i have this i have that so do you guys have any or can you think of one um i don't know why but sometimes it feels like heuristics are really intertwined with um the sort of small i don't know so our parents right so they would say stuff like um don't do this or this will happen so suppose your slipper it flips and yeah. immediately people will go that okay you're going to have a fight <laughs> and i don't know why but somehow growing up it felt like this had become a part of my behavior and then when i studied about heuristics i don't know i always found that it was somewhat intertwined that any time someone says to me ki um if you'll flip your slipper you'll have a fight i would think that oh maybe they are bihari as well because <laughs> my parents are biharis and they would always say something like this yeah, so i don't yeah someone was, someone was saying something i guess yeah that was my younger brother i'm sorry okay. okay so uh, also one thing i forgot to mention that heuristics actually help you um uh, can uh, actually can help you and can you know cannot help you also that um, like uh, there are rules of thumb like um, if we are we, are, we have been asked you know in ex- uh, we are giving some quant exam or maybe there is something like uh, we have 5 into 5 then it just comes out into our mind that yeah it's 25 but if if we have given you know 75 into uh, 365 so it will take a while so heuristics actually help us and sometimes it doesn't because it just you know it dev- uh, makes us you know it just takes us away from our rational self or maybe you know the conscious self and puts us in into autopilot mode so it's all up to you that uh, uh, uh that how you want to use your heuristics and everybody has that okay while studying behavioral economics i had this question always that um i have a lot of heuristics and i know that this uh, and this is a kind of bias in my heuristic but this has always helped me okay this has always helped me so should i correct that or it is okay because after studying behavioral economics i cannot ignore the fact that yes this is my bias but i'm witnessing it so uh, i asked this from savita ma'am only so uh, so she told me that you know it's all up to us like how you want to use your heuristics that um, it's it's like just like uh, you know anshi said that uh, our parents tell us these things like uh, you should do this you should not do this like uh, uh, wake up in the morning it's good for health or uh, you know if you are going to wake early you are going to do great or you're going to remember many of the things uh, it's like people have you know inculcated those things in their habits and they don't know about it that, that yes if there is a exam i have to get up i have to get up early and i have to study because it's their brain working in action okay so uh, yeah it's it's another science that yeah that how is it going to work but it helps them despite knowing the fact that it's not necessary that you're going to remember that if uh, if you're going to wake up in the morning only uh, wake up, wake up and study in the morning only and not in the evening or you know late night study you know night owls so that is not the case it's it's all up to us um so uh, now we are on the uh, hedonic adaptation so in hedonic adaptation what happens uh, acha uh, let me tell uh, let me tell you simply uh, simply that uh, you guys have of course felt this that you think that if i buy this or if i get this i'm going to be really happy and you become happy after getting that or buying that but after some time you again go back to your you know original level of satisfaction that okay yeah i have that not satisfaction original level of happiness okay so and this uh, and this cycle 
always happens like uh, you want to buy you know um, a typical um, not typical uh, i mean a uh, really good uh, fountain pen that yeah i want to buy this you bought and you are happy your your happiness shifted to you know normal levels after some time and then another thing comes up and you're like okay i want to buy this so this is and you will be and you are happy again and you know um so this is called hedonic adaptation this happens all the time to all of us even in economics i mean uh, you know not in behavioral economics even in economics uh, there was a research on um happiness levels that um uh, you if you guys have studied um, microeconomics from i guess nicholson nicholson then um, in one of nicholson or maybe a uh, macroeconomics uh, i don't remember the book but there was a graph that showed that after some time i mean happiness and income it it is not always you know one kind of relation that it said that if if you have if you don't have uh, you know um, minimum level of income to you know just uh, satisfy your needs basic needs your necessities then you will be really happy when you, when you will have uh, augments in your income okay you will be really happy you will witness those things but if you if you have um, you know good amount of money and you are your happiness is your your necessities have been fulfilled it's like you are on luxury you can buy luxury items then increase in same amount of you know income or maybe more amount of income is not going to make you a lot more happier okay it's it would be like okay fine so why this uh, why this is happening is you know because of these reasons which contribute to hedonic adaptation and because of hedonic adaptation and things like that because psychology and you know income effects and all so that research found that um in developed countries like usa and all of those countries people's happiness level were less okay were lesser than the countries which were developing okay which because they didn't have income right so you guys can relate what it, what it is about and you can you guys can search about it i just wanted to share this income and happiness because as an economist i guess everybody is going to ask you that uh, income and happiness how how this is related like that cryptocurrency that uh, tell me about cryptocurrency so yeah um and uh, so coming to hedonic adaptation so what are the solutions to break this cycle so introduce novelty in your you know life or in your things like if you have you know get got bored in pandemic that i have been bored that uh, from buying stuff and all so stop buying stuff or maybe you know stop buying the similar kind of stuff uh, introduce something else like um, you know buy some dance class okay dance class courses or maybe you know edx courses or things like that introduce some new things and Uh, another thing is mix it up okay so like if you are doing the same kinds of things like uh, your routine has gotten bored even if you are uh, waking up in the morning it used to make you really happy but now it it's like okay you are like uh, okay i'm like satisfied okay fine so mix it up like uh, change those things like uh, um, probably after waking up do some nice things for yourself mix things up okay so these are going to help you in uh, you know breaking the hedonic cycle and of course surprises and opportunities learning learning tasks and uh, you know taking risk and meeting new people these things will always help you to understand like uh, i guess um, like when uh, i have studied one thing um, i don't know studied or it is written somewhere in ncert books like uh, if you want to you know Uh, realize that how happy you are you just uh, you just have to look uh, so at someone who is poor who uh, who has lower wealth than you you will understand a lot of things and you know uh, you will be grateful so these th- those things are connected okay so yeah um okay it's 550 so i had more topics um i'm uh, what i'm going to do at Uh, that at the end of the session i'm going to just you know give you these youtube video links that you can you know check it out on your own and uh, these were the topics i wanted to you know talk to you about like planner and doer like uh, uh, okay i'm just going to brief about it like important 
one uh, most important one is the planner and doer you guys must have experienced this that um, you guys have planned okay i'm gonna do this i'm gonna exercise from this month i'm gonna exercise from this monday for sure and when when it comes to sunday or monday morning you're like okay fine i'm so tired i have enjoyed sunday a lot okay let's take it you know to another day or maybe i'm gonna eat healthy so, uh, you decide that yes you're gonna do this but when it when it comes to the time when when, when you are actually gonna do it you're not you're not able to do it everybody has faced these uh, these things in uh, you know all aspects of our life or maybe most of the aspects of our life so this is the planner and the doer concept i cannot explain more but you guys can you know check about it and save more tomorrow this is a really good paper um, it has helped a lot of people in usa i mean for their retirement programs like in india there had always been you know retirement programs that um, um, you are already enrolled okay and you're gonna just get the money right now it uh, companies are introducing those things also private companies but in government offices it's always have uh, in government jobs it, it was always there but it was not that much in usa uh, usa probably or maybe you know private sector but they introduced this save tomorrow it's it, it involves you know some concepts uh, if you are interested in you know saving more and things like that you can check out that paper and uh, okay so uh what do you guys uh, want oh, okay uh, so should i talk about my project um see it's a simple project um may, uh, it's just you know i did a behavioral finance project and found some things um i'll share you this ppd you can read about it or maybe you know you know just research about it or you guys want to talk yeah kushpu we have a few questions and a girl has raised her hand so yeah maybe okay. we can answer Okay, uh, so, you can unmute okay, so um, I have two questions. Yeah. So the first is, do heuristics include logic or can they include logic? Mm -hmm. See, um, it can include logic and it cannot. Both can happen. Like when you design your own heuristic, like... Um, uh, have you experienced some things that I have done this mistake? I'm not gonna do this again. Okay, yeah, fir, um, I should not have, you know, went there uh, at that point of time because that place is so crowded and I do not want to go there or things like that. So when when you are designing or putting logics, right? Putting logics or your reasons or maybe your experiences. So it can include logics. And sometimes it's like that, uh, you know, um um i guess anchi yeah anchi said shared that uh, uh our wait a second you asked about hedonic adaptation or heuristics sorry heuristics heuristics now okay so yeah that's right so uh, as uh, she men mentioned that uh we we actually don't know about that you know why our parents tell us or or why our friends were like that but they tell us okay so it's like having logic and not having logic and it's just you can make your heuristics and you can logically check them that your your heuristics are logical or not or what is it okay okay and the second question is is hedonic or does the logic behind hedonic adaptation include marginal utility concept mm, yeah good question um I guess we can say that and it's actually really uh, you know really plausible it's 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 in higher sense that yeah actually as economic student we can completely agree that yeah it comes to that level that yeah marginal utility is is into play that we we have been witnessing yeah okay thank you but but you know it i haven't read about it uh, you know that that yes there is a relation but yes there is an this is another thing to explore you can also uh, think about it and i i could and also search about it thank you for the question okay okay um anyone else okay i'm gonna read if you guys have any question and you want to speak about it just you know start speaking Electricity. Okay, you can 
Yes, I can say that. Um, um, Padmaja, right? Uh, I'm sorry if I... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Padmaja. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, it's totally there. That, yeah, I explained you about that. Uh, I told you about that, you know, black people and white people thing. And yeah, it's it's there. It's a lot. It's a lot. Like in, in countries like India, I'm not going to, you know, uh, you know, demoralize about our country. But, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, I mean... Uh, how do I put it? Um, the concept of accepting things and taking things as, you know, indifferently or maybe accepting things as uh, individually that yes, they have their own space or, you know, things like that, that yes, it cannot happen. These things, prejudice and stereotypes, there are, uh, it is a lot prevalent in our country. I, I think, but as, I, as I'm studying things, I, I got to know that, yes, it's everywhere. But as we are growing here, we can see that, yeah, it's there. And yes, it's a heuristic. It's many of it, it is a heuristic. But it depends on that exactly point that how is it going to deal with it? That, you know, heuristic, is, it, it is simply a tool, uh, sorry, uh, a rule of thumb. Okay, if you guys have studied physics, then you have uh, studied um, there was some rules of thumb for, you know, um, yeah, yeah, magnetism. Magnetism. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Rules of thumb. So it's like that. You have to see that, yeah, it's in that category or not. But to your question, yes, it can be. It was a good question. Uh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Super distance. Yeah, it's there. It's like, you know, this, just the previous question. Uh, yes, we can say that. <laughs> yeah, Harshavardhan, yeah, I agree. It's like that. It happens. Um, you know, uh, we can categorize that um, as that. But uh, yeah, but it's not that instant. Like, I have experienced hedonic adaptation. Like, um, if I bought something... I have been looking for like a lot of days and I'll be happy like, you know, two, three days. Till that point, I do not think that my dopamine levels would be that high. You know, they just, they have, you know, shorter lives. Okay. So basically, no hedonic adaptation is slower dopamine hit. Yeah, we can say that. Okay. Yeah, see, uh, uh, to your question, uh, yes, uh, yes, they are positive too. We all get better because of heuristics. Uh, I have experienced in my, uh, I have experienced this a lot of times that if I have been doing some heuristics and it is full of bias also, but it has always produced results for me, then yes, I'm going to stick to that because that is a positive thing. This is what behavioral economics lets us, you know, it just opens up our mind that you can, you can classify that, okay, this is what, what it is. And do you want to keep it or not? And it, it is helping you or not? So yeah, positive things. Yeah, they let us excel. Yes, completely agreed. Anyone else? And uh, do you want to add anything? Or you know, just share your experience, like planner and doer and things like that. Or do you want to ask any questions about resources or maybe, you know, how do you want to go in your career? Like I have asked a lot of people that how to go about it and, you know, uh, where to find people like that and how, what things should I require to become a behavioral economist or behavioral scientist? Um, so, can I ask something about your graduation? Like, what did you do for graduation? My graduation or post graduation? Oh, graduation. Okay, graduation. So basically, uh, I am an uh, I am economics honors. I just studied basic economics, you know, in the curriculum, and it was simply, you know, the coursework. I I was just interested in economics, and I pursued that. I was like, okay fine i'm going to do that only and i just studied and um things came along 
like if you if if you want to know that i have been always you know interested in behavioral economics so and in my grad i was in yeah do you want okay. to say anything? sorry in undergrad actually yeah i uh, yeah harshvardhan i follow a lot of you know community and uh, forums like uh, first of all on facebook you can find uh, many many groups like one of them is uh, i guess um, its name is one is behavioral scientist it's on linkedin also it's uh, they have their uh, own website also behavioral scientist uh, uh, there you are going to you know get to know about a really you know high le uh, high level kind of webinars like i got richard thaler i got to attend the richard thaler webinar from there only so um, behavioral scientist than economics groups than behavioral economics groups uh, that is on facebook and and on linkedin um, i have been following um, um, like in india i have been following one iben then bias b i a s it's a delhi based um, yeah it's a delhi based organization even you guys can apply there for internships or maybe you know ras or you can just approach the professors uh, you know someone who is working there like one one of them i know uh, his his name is sujoy i guess sujoy he's a jne professor so you can you know check that bias group and then um, you can you can go anywhere like uh, i'm experiencing my my one um, one thing that uh, uh i was going across uh, things on linkedin and i just saw uh, B bit canada you know behavioral insights team canada and i saw there was a opening position for research associate and uh, i saw that their hiring process was really good so, you know you guys can check those stuff do not limit yourselves i'm going i'm not going to lecture yourself on you know life thoughts and things about that no i'm just going to tell you about how you can not limit yourself and you know just keep on doing things so i started following you know to your community forum thing that i started following uh, bit canada and uh, and i got to experience a lot of things there in through my application of course i didn't got selected but yeah uh, there there were the, their process was really good okay so yeah i can share i guess uh, the community list and other things on uh, to nivida i guess and she would share with you guys okay, thank um, you so much yeah you're welcome uh, no not dan or really is a reader um, what reader base is, is it a group or you know just uh, um, involved in his community oh, as in were you familiar with his work what come again So, were you familiar with his book is what yeah i, I am uh, you know uh, i keep handy this book this is my you know bedtime book i i am i'm like really fond of dan arely his works his experiences and everything he he tells you know you can relate to those things so i actually had a question on that it's related to um, i guess behavioral in a way but right now if you would be familiar with what had happened there was this fraudulent data set that was found in one of his research and that yeah. was his research yeah as far as i remember yeah so there were a lot of articles on it so my question was that um this is the this is like a one time that on a researcher's work Uh, i mean on his work this was the first time and i guess the only time that a question was raised so do you feel that in the behavioral community in the very least there will be some biases now against him even when the work is not going to be or even if the work is approved uh and has been checked and so on so do you feel that once if a person suppose makes a mistake or has something highlighted in public then for at least for a behavioral A, a person in behavioral sciences that is already very um, neglected compared to the other fields of economics it's going to create a major setback in their work or at least their reader base okay mm, yeah so i guess it's it depends on uh, what he will do majorly but yeah there are factors into play like you know um, like uh, um like um 
like familiar uh, familiarity by not familiarity bias i guess there are a lot of biases like you know you like to follow famous people and stuff like that so there are biases that um, if someone has done it like laws aversion also that he has been doing a lot of great work but now he he just did something bad that is his loss so it is going to come up in our minds like a huge thing more than the gains this is where prospect theory this is where um, loss aversion comes into play okay so this is one of that perspective it also depends on his uh, way of doing works like if he's going to you know devote his a lot of time into research and do some ground breaking research or just you know tell the reasons about that maybe it it is going to go like uh, i guess you guys would be knowing about about that narendra modi and his image in the past and not uh, right now right like gujarat uh, you know gujarat masak and everything so it's not sure there but it has been said so there was a blot on his image and things like that so but eventually it got washed up so it depends on that person that how he is going to deal with it but yeah for behavioral um, economist it it depends on us our rational selves that are we going to take it take him as a good researcher from all of his work or just going to judge him on that one research because you know the contributions of any person is not limited to his one or two papers i i personally think that maybe maybe there can be some ground breaking uh, ground breaking research but it is not you know that happens in you know one once that you just become intelligent no you have those things you just keep on building the, those things so i guess it's all about time yeah that that answers my question thank you anyone else wants to have any uh, ask any question or want to share their experience or or you know discuss any about topic because we are <laughs> we have crossed our time i guess yeah we started on 5 right um guys if you have any question so you can put it in the chat it's already 6 so if there's nothing i guess we can wrap this up Ah, uh, don't call me, ma'am, please. Ah, ah, I thought don't. I'm just your, you know, kind peer. Okay, so don't think in that way. And just keep on, you know, researching and try to do things. Ah, uh, like I, when I started, ah, uh, I just, I know I'm taking your time, but you know, I'm just sharing this because if it is gonna, just like I said in the, ah, uh, you know, initial time, that. if it is going to help anyone that i would be really happy because i have i have struggled a lot and i didn't know about things and i'm not that you know i'm not that knowledgeable but i but behavioral economics tries to you know behavioral economics uh, satisfies my intellectual curiosity a lot so you can you can just approach people like yeah uh, about forum and community uh, there is um, beast beast uh, you can apply there for uh, you can first of all you can call them uh, there is there is a option to talk to the founder uh, and ask your questions for 30 minutes you can do that okay and you can ask them your uh, your questions and your doubts and how to go about things in behavioral economics then there is a person named uh, jafar something um karan arora yeah right uh, jafar something uh, yeah exactly he he started um calls uh, maybe short calls on menza okay menza uh, i guess yeah that is the app right so uh, it's it's there on ibens whatsapp group i'm i'm going to give this to nivida to share with you all there is a group of whatsapp on iben uh, it contains a lot, a lot of people and he has started you know that you guys can talk to him and ask things personally and talk to on call so things like that and you guys can if you are interested in academics or maybe more behavioral economics you can do ras with professors you can just email them that yeah i am interested in your work and i want to work i want to work with you they'll take you of course it would probably it could be non funded i am also doing ra but you know you you will learn a lot of things
Okay, so I guess it's all okay now. Um, do you guys have anything? Uh, Nivida, can you just share the feedback form? If you guys have one minute just to fill the feedback form. Yeah, just a minute. Um, we can also like email it. Uh, yeah, I can send it on the WhatsApp group. So, okay, what's form will be shared. Okay, okay. And do share um, with the results, okay? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, and uh, do you guys want to say something to me about, you know, the lecture was not good or like, actually feedback? No, no, I think it was personally I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so I, I really enjoyed the lecture. I got to learn a lot. It was great, honestly. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, so, yeah. And if you guys want to keep in touch with me, um, um, yeah, Nivida will share, uh, will share my email ID with you guys and you can join me anywhere and you can always ask me questions and about to your, you know, your CVs even that, yeah, my CV is uh, looking good or not and things like that because these things matter. I have gotten a help, I have gotten a lot of help from Alum, you know, really early seniors and they, they are really nice. So I just want to pay back those things and it, it would be great if I'm able to help you in any kind of way. So, yeah. Okay, so should we end the webinar? Uh, yeah, I guess. I'll share the details that you share with me. And yeah, and I'll share the feedback for me. Okay, um, one more thing, uh, just one more thing. Keep uh, keep nudging and, you know, rationalizing things and thinking about in those ways. Like, create small nudges in your life. Uh, like you, if you don't want to, you know, exercise, then uh, anchor it with something like you enjoy, like listening to music, like five minutes of ex five minutes of you know doing crunches, and uh, stick it with. If I'm gonna listen to this song, I'm gonna do the crunches. So anchor those things. Use behavioral economics in your life. It's not just a subject. It's it's actually a lot applicable. Okay. Yeah. That's all from my, my side and thank you all for being such a great audience and yeah, I enjoyed a lot with you and because I, you guys have been, you know, a lot helping uh, in my, you know, um, releasing my strength to make you understand things or deliver the concepts. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for the informative session. Yeah, uh, sorry. Thank you for this informative session. It's okay. Uh, it's a privilege. And keep doing things and take care and stay safe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.